technique in the world. It's been around for how many years? Hundreds, thousands of years? All over the world, people walk into classrooms and say, good morning, students, good morning, teacher. Open your books on page 26, they said. Yes, teacher. And then I point to the students and I say, read the first line of the text. And the student reads the first line of the text. And they read it badly. And much worse is that they know they're reading it badly. And even worse is the other students also know they're reading it badly. And the other problem about it is that it doesn't help anyone understand the text at all. Why is this such a popular technique? And yet reading aloud is one of the best things you can ever do in class, provided you do it in a way that actually helps students. So if we were to take the story of Ferdinand and Paul, then it would be perfectly possible to say to students, now we've read this story, I want you to look at this text and choose your favorite sentence. What's your favorite sentence on the screen? What's the one that you like best? And so the students all go to the screen and they underline the sentence that they like best. The next instruction is, the next instruction is, right, you are going to read your favorite sentence aloud to the rest of the class. But I'll give you three minutes to practice the sentence. And so this, you, you go into a classroom, you'll hear all the students mumbling away to each other. Mm -hmm. You like to just sit in the And then when the students read out the sentence that they have chosen as their favorite sentence, something really important happens and reading aloud becomes a beautiful and wonderful activity. But the ingredient that makes it so special, this is like a bad Monty Python sketch, the two ingredients that make it really successful. One is that the students chose it themselves, their favorite sentence, not the teachers, the students chose it themselves. And the second is we've given them time to practice saying it before we ask them to say it. So what seems to have happened there is that our fog catcher is working really well now because the students have caught the language they want, put it in their suitcase, and then learned how to say it. My metaphors are getting terribly mixed up, forgive me, but that's the problem with metaphors. They get uh, a bit mixed up. Um, this isn't just a fanciful piece of talk. This is an article by Gregory Friedman. He was teaching in Japan at a university, and he got his students to go online, because they could, and take from what they found online the words and phrases that they liked best. And then they created their own online dictionary, their own online collection of words that they liked best. Words that they had collected from the air, from the, the, the English world around them. And, and what happened then is that this group of students ended up with their own digital suitcase of words and phrases that they collected and which they wanted to know and remember and use. So the first answer to me, for me, about how to become good grammar or language catchers uh, is about 5% of the people we teach or interact with probably do it anyway, and good luck to them, and I'm incredibly jealous and envious because the rest of us don't do it in that kind of way. But for the other 95%, what we need to do is to kind of provoke them, push them into trying to collect words with, with their hearts and, and with enthusiasm and so on and so forth. And the more we do this, the more we say, put it in your suitcase, you choose words that you like, tell me words that you like, the more we do that, the more we constantly reinforce the message that if you want to be a good language catcher, you've got to go out and look and catch the moisture as it comes in over the mountains and use your fog catching or language catcher to do it. And here's a little activity, by the way, which works for me perfectly, and I'll just mention it quickly because um, I want to move on to something else. This is an activity which uh, a colleague and friend called Adrian Underhill talks about frequently. Does anyone know the name Adrian Underhill? Yeah, yes, yes. Yeah, he, his pronunciation is his thing. He's got lots of things, as it happens, but he's really, really, really good on pronunciation. And uh, his point, what he says, is that everyone 
pronounces a foreign language all the time. The moment you think in a foreign language, the moment you read in a foreign language, the moment you read in your own language, you know what you're doing? You're pronouncing, even if you're completely silent. So when you read something in Arabic, in French, in Spanish, in English, there's this, there's this little gap where you actually vocalize it in your mind's eye, in your brain. And so he says, how about this as an activity? Take a sound, this is up, like up. And what you need to do is to read this paragraph, which you are now very familiar with in this auditorium, read this paragraph and find out how many words in that paragraph have the sound up. Would you just like to do that? And I want you to speak the paragraph aloud, but only in your head, so we can't hear it. So just have a quick, speak it aloud in your head, and see how many words you can find in that text which have the sound up. because you're trying to work out which of these which of these words have what sound and so on and so forth. So far so good. I've got a quick story to tell you. This is a woman called Christina Torre. And Christina uh, is a New Yorker and uh, she's a huge fan of the game baseball because her father was for some years manager of the New York uh, uh, New York you know, those guys, the baseball New Yorkers. That's what he was manager of. I knew I knew that. Anyway, this is a true story, by the way. Uh, Christina one day went to Bay Ridge in Brooklyn, which is an area of New York, and she was going to visit a friend of hers who just had a baby. And so she called in and bought the baby a present. And then she went to her favorite coffee shop, because she used to live in Bay Ridge, Brooklyn, some time ago. And she took her coffee outside, and it was outside of a brownstone like this with a, with a fire escape. And she was sitting there uh, with her back to the building, not thinking about very much drinking her coffee, when a man came up to her and he said, could you please ring 911? That's the American emergency number. Could you please ring 911? He spoke very calmly. He said, there's a baby on the fire escape and we need to get the emergency services here to rescue the baby. So Christina got out her phone and very slowly turned around. And 25 feet up in the air was a little baby. She learned later that the baby was called Dylan. And the baby was right on the edge of the fire escape, on its tummy, perfectly happy. Ten months old, perfectly happy baby. And she rang 911. She said, you've got to come quickly because, you know, this is and meanwhile, other people in the cafe went running into the, into the building to try and find the parents. It turned out they were asleep and they didn't know the baby. Well, of course they didn't know the baby was on the fire escape. So they didn't know. So she looked around and she made eye contact with the baby. And the baby kind of smiled. It's happy, happy, happy. But still, she was very, very frightened. And sure enough, about 20 seconds later, the baby fell. And as it fell, it gripped onto railings and it hung there precariously for a few seconds but this is a baby a 10 month old baby you know it's not going to be able to hold on for long so Christina stood under the fire escape positioned herself and waited and the baby fell as it fell it hit a sign for a yoga school and hit its face on the sign and started to cry and everyone around Christina gasped in fright and horror. But she just stood there and held up her arms, held out her arms, and the baby fell into her arms. She said Dylan felt almost weightless, completely, and cried for a little bit, and then stopped crying because it was rather interested in what was going on. And she just stood there in shock, with this baby in her, in her arms. 
And then the parents rushed up and they took the baby from her and they hugged her and they thanked her and everyone around her thanked her uh, for what she'd done. Uh, and, and there was hugging and thanking and shaking hands and laughter and huge relief from everyone in the coffee shop and of course from Dylan's parents. And it was only later when she got onto the subway that she was sitting on the subway and she suddenly burst into tears with the kind of, that, you know that response, that delayed shock response? And that's the story of Christina Torre, how she saved the baby. Now then, this is what I want you to do. I want you to uh, choose one of the following three people. So listen carefully. You can, if you want to, be Christina. If you want to, you can be Christina. Or you can be someone else who was at the coffee store and witnessed the whole incident. Or, if you want, you can be Dylan, aged 20. Be Dylan, aged 20, 20 years old. So those are the three roles. You can be, you can be uh, Christina, someone who witnessed the incident, and Dylan, 20 years on. Okay? So make a choice. Have you made a choice? Okay, so what I want you to do now is to tell your story to the person sitting next to you. Tell the story of that day. And the person sitting next to you has to guess which you are. Are you Dylan, 20 years older? Are you an observer in the cafe? Or are you Christine? Are you ready for this? Okay, so turn to the person next to you and tell them the story. Off you go. Off you go. Off you go. Did you manage to tell the story to the other people? Yes, yes or no? Yes! yes. I, I should just explain why I did that. Um, the problem about standing up here uh, is, is that the lights are so bright that I can't actually see you. Is there anybody here? Yes. One or two, okay. Um, why, do, why do we get people to tell and retell stories? Well, it's a kind of advanced form of grammar catching, language catching. Because the idea is that you've heard a story. If I'm lucky, you thought it was quite an interesting story. It is a true story, I promise you. Uh, you can find it if you Google Christina Torrey and I caught a falling baby, you will find this story. And my hope is that you found it interesting enough to be engaged with what's going on. To be, to be interested in the story you were hearing. But then when I get you to tell it again, you're forced to go back to what you heard, the words you heard, the language you heard, the phrases you heard, you're forced to go back to that. Uh, and if you like, catch the words and the phrases more exactly than before. And if I were to go on with this, and by the way, uh, the reason I asked you to tell it from the perspective of three different people and the others are supposed to work out who's telling the story is because that gives it a little bit of a free song, a little bit. But what we're doing here, the fibres of the fog catcher, that's what this activity is. It's about the fibres of the fog catcher, the construction you have to build in order to get vapour from the air. And we think that storytelling is one of the best ways of doing that. Or rather, I probably need to rephrase that. 